welcome Nolan to the World XP podcast. Um, Nolan is a what is the correct term? Wildlife firefighter is that the correct Wild term? Wildland Wildland firefighter out in Montana. Um, it's been a while. I know the last time you were playing college ball, and then I think you tried to you're looking at maybe joining the Air Force or something like that, and then ended up out in out in Montana. How'd you get there? And good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, I ended up out in Montana. I visited my sister. She lives out there. Visited her a few times uh, through college. And uh, once the Air Force spent a year trying to get in and having too many injuries for them, I uh, finally came to the conclusion it was time to just get out of the city and uh, found a job working for the Montana Conservation Corps. They had a chainsaw thinning project team and we'd go out and camp for nine days, cut some trees down, come back. And I lived in my truck for about three months and then ended up running into a guy who uh, was teaching me chainsaw stuff. And he worked at the uh, fire unit in Helena, Montana and ended up asking me if I wanted to fight fire. And I said, heck yeah. So that's how I kind of stumbled into this career and fell in love with it. Did you kind of did you know what you were getting into when uh, when he asked you to join, or was it kind of uh, more than you bargained for? Um, I mean, I knew it was kind of like a rough neck kind of job, um, like, and I always like loved getting my hands dirty. I loved being outside and camping out and just kind of being tested mentally and physically. And I think like you you can kind of have some expectations, but once you like truly get on a fire like the first time, like everything gets thrown out the window and uh, it kind of gets in your blood. Um, but yeah, at first, my first experience on the fire, I was kind of taken aback at really how crazy it was like, being on the fire line. So. Gotcha. So, when, so most people, I think, mm, I'm not going to say most people, I'll say a good chunk of people, their understanding of forest fires or wildfires ends with Smokey the Bear, um, and anything past that is kind of just doesn't exist. Um, so when you like, when you guys are out there and there's like a a brush fire, a forest fire, what sort of like, how do you guys sort of assess the situation, and then what sort of like techniques do you guys use um, to fight it and or contain it? Yeah. So um, my crew were. Uh... We're an initial attack crew, so we'll get a smoke report call in um, and our dispatch center is on our unit and they'll uh, page our radio. So we'll get this tone that comes through. When we hop on our engine, we kind of have a general idea of where it is. Um, sometimes we got to drive up to like an hour or more to get to the fire because it's up in the mountains somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And uh, once we get close to the area, we're just kind of keeping our eyes peeled for a plume of smoke. Um, once we see it, we pull up um depending how many resources we get there volunteers go and they usually beat us there but we get out if we can get water to it we have these 500 gallon tanks on the back of our rigs um we pretty much just drive like pickup trucks like f550s with water tanks on the back and a pump system and a bunch of plumbing hoses so if we can get water to the fire we try to lay out hose get water on it as soon as possible but a lot of times it's too much of a hike and we just throw our packs on and all of our fire gear, which is just pretty much uh, a yellow button down shirt and these Nomex pants, which are fire resistant. Throw on the hard hat, grab a hand tool. Um, we hike up to the fire, kind of assessing the weather on our way up. Uh, we, we usually get weather reports too. We get a briefing every morning on fire danger and how severe it can be. And uh, big things that play a part of that are like temperature, uh, if it's above, 80 and humidity is below 20 percent and the winds are going 20 miles an hour or more then there's a good chance the fire is going to blow up on us so we're going into that aware of that and we hike up to the fire uh, we find the origin of the fire uh, where it started and we kind of split off into two we go on the flanks uh, we call them the flanks to so the sides of the fire and we kind of just dig a line right up on the flame uh, next to it, uh, down to mineral soil, dirt, so there's nothing else that it can burn. So it kind of stops it in its tracks there. Um, that's the goal at least. And then we take that up both sides until we meet up top at the middle. So we kind of split our crews into two. So and, when, you're, uh, 
when you're yeah. digging like so i guess the the goal is so the fire doesn't have anything to burn mm -hmm. and so when you how deep do you have to dig and how like and i don't want to say typical because i'm sure no two fires are the same ever but generally speaking if it was say like a smaller fire how deep do you have to dig and sort of do you dig like in a circle around it or like how do you like yeah so we we get right up on the flame normally when we're there's two ways to fight it there's directly fighting it and indirect um but in like regards to directly fighting it we're right up next to the flames and we're digging everything every all the vegetation we're it just we go as deep as we need to until we get all dirt which sometimes isn't that deep but if there's like roots and stuff we got to split up the roots because the fire can actually travel underground through the roots which is a big pain in the ass and um so yeah we we don't usually dig so deep but we dig uh, about like 36 inches wide um it all kind of depends how high the flames are if the flames are like up at my face then we're digging pretty pretty wide um for that but yeah it's just getting it all to dirt and uh, leaving no vegetation or anything that the fire can kind of creep into and then cross over our line. So, gotcha. and then and then we kind of just, yeah, we dig around it on both sides until we meet up at the top with the other crew and we have it buttoned up. Gotcha. You mentioned um, volunteers. So I, I would imagine that they don't have the same level of equipment or training that, that you guys do. Is there, a, is there ever a point where, and this is kind of a, a tangent, but is there ever a point when you don't want them to be there? Um, like the volunteers, and they they vary a lot. Some of their um, like engine bosses and squad bosses are like older folk that have been in fire their entire life and like kind of hit a point where they didn't want to do it full time anymore but they loved it so much that they just wanted to volunteer and do it every now and then. So some guys have way more experience than my engine bosses. And uh, then there's guys that are on volunteer crews that are trying to get into the game, but um, there it's always nice having extra resources there um, working a fire because it'll kick your butt no matter how many people are there. So the more, the better. And uh, the only time we don't want them there is when we get selfish and kind of want to get there first and take care of that fire <laughs> it's kind of a pride thing i guess uh, that's <laughs> it's, kind of like, it's like a race <laughs> no, i'm sure i'm sure um so you mentioned you're part of you said initial attack crew is that is that correct so what sorts of are by the way that you said that i would assume that there's more than just that mm -hmm. can you kind of go into what the other sorts of crews are and, and what they do i know on on TV, I've seen guys like jump out of planes with like buckets of water or whatever they mm -hmm. do. So. Yeah, so my my unit is all initial attack. We have just those engines and we have a hell attack on our base as well. So we have access to a helicopter. Um, they have their own crew too. And they'll, hell attack will fly their guys into a fire. Um, they'll drop their guys off and they'll uh, kind of IC the fire, which is like the incident command. So they'll control getting resources and they'll direct the uh, helicopter to give water bucket drops on the fire. Um, so that's one crew. Helicopters also can transport resources like my crew or any other hand crews. And uh, and hand crews are another type. Uh, those are usually like an 18 to 20 man crew. Um, it's a larger crew. They usually just take in hand tools and chainsaws and they'll have uh, two guys with saws go in the front and two guys, they're called swampers. They'll uh, be grabbing all the cut brush and trees and throwing it away from the fire. And then the rest of the crew will follow behind the dig fire line. And um, then there's on top of that, there's hot shots. And those are the guys that they make the movies about. You'll see them on TV in California. They're uh, kind of like the elite of the elite hikers. And they'll, they'll go to the big ones. Um, they go for extended periods of time, like two week, two week hauls to whatever fire they're called to. Um, yeah, those guys are pretty badass. They'll uh, they'll dig forever, and uh, from there, then you got smoke jumpers. Those guys do initial attack as well, except they're stationed at the airport and they wait for a call to a fire that is like unreachable or unhikeable, or at least very difficult to hike to. 
and they want to get people there as soon as possible. So they'll fly a plane and they'll parachute out and then they'll drop their gear and go get their gear and start working on it. And um, I think that's the majority of the crews. Um, then we have like planes that can drop um, that red stuff, the retardant mm -hmm. that doesn't put the fire out. They, they'll throw that on unburned fuels. All that stuff does is kind of just slow the fire down and create a big mess of just red sticky stuff all over the place that you don't want on your boots. <laughs> So. Uh, um you mentioned uh earlier well like when you get the call and like if it takes you a while to get there and the volunteers get there first at, at, at least for i'll say for like the normal fire department that you would think of the response times are fairly quick um does how much does that time cost you in terms of size of fire yeah. um like location that sort of stuff yeah and it all it all depends on like the weather and we're aware that if it's going to be a day where if a lightning strike gets called in that that fire is going to blow up in 10 minutes and be 100 acres like that and uh we know if that's a possibility um and if that's the case usually that's when like helicopters will go in and check it out first and make sure that it's not getting out of control and um yeah and it, it 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 is tough with our response times being so slow we just have so much rural land to cover and mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't even hear about a fire until it's already 10 plus acres you know so it's it, it makes it makes the job difficult um but yeah it's kind of what you sign up for it's that that thrill of the unknown you kind of don't know what you're getting into until you get on it so a 10 plus acre fire to dig around i'd imagine that takes takes a while yeah yeah, yeah we had a uh, our biggest one in helena area last year was it was early in the season so it wasn't really blowing up but uh it was wind driven we had like 60 plus mile per hour winds and everything was still kind of green it wasn't really dried up yet um but the wind literally just pushed this fire and it created a, a thousand acre fire in like late May. And that one, like when you get that big, you can't really dig around the whole thing. You kind of get it at its hot points. And so our thing is when we get a fire contained, we call it contained when we believe it's, there's no possibility of spreading. At that point, um, we go through, we call it mop up which is probably the worst part of the job. And that's like, when you see pictures of guys like covered with all that stuff on their face, it's usually mm -hmm. from mop up because we're on our hands and knees, like crawling through the fire, feeling for heat. And if we feel heat, then we got to cool it down with either water or mixing it with soil and doing whatever. And so that's, that's usually what we'll do for big fires is kind of like get it under control. We'll have line around it for the most part. Um, we do try to get a full line around everything and get it buttoned up, but yeah, a lot of it's the mop up and making sure that there's no more hot spots left in it buried underneath. Mm. So. Yeah, that seems not fun. <laughs> yeah, um, you, gotta, you gotta love it. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned um, when we were talking the other day. You mentioned uh, in your your summary text, kind of of. of what the job entails you mentioned that you guys would start a fire to fight the fire how does that work yeah so that that would be indirectly fighting it um so if the fire is like large enough and coming in pretty hot um i i haven't personally been able to do this yet i really want to um but this is like a lot of what the hot shot crews will do is they'll they'll dig a indirect line so they'll be away from the fire like say like a ridge away or down below it and um they'll dig a line to an anchor point like a road or something that's stable and they have a good escape route and um they'll purposely start a fire that heads towards the head of the fire coming towards them and those two fires kind of draw towards each other and the objective is to burn out all the fuel in front of that fire so that when they meet it kind of just kills itself so there's nothing really left for it to burn at that point. So that's, it's a pretty bold strategy. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it just makes it stronger. It picks it up and just keeps taking off. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's one of the tactics that a lot of people use is uh, they call it backfiring or burnout. Yeah. I could, 
Oh, I'm about to make the worst pun ever. I was going to say, I can see that definitely backfiring. I just, uh, just should save those for another day. I'm not old enough to make those types of jokes yet. Um, We're getting there, though. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't remind me. Um, so how long how long have you been doing this? Has it been one season or two seasons, or you've been out there for a couple of years? Or This will be my second season coming up, yep. Um, that chainsaw job I had was – partially involved with fire because it was fuels reduction so mm-hmm. doing thinning projects I kind of got somewhat of an understanding from it but um yeah last year was when I really got educated on the whole whole business of wildfire so mm. it'll be nice the second year uh not being a rookie anymore at the unit so looking forward to that so when you're like first first time on the job call comes in what is sort of going through your head? What is, what's the emotions like when you get there? What did, what were you expecting versus what was it actually like? Did you have, I know you, your chainsaw crew kind of dealt with some fire a little bit, but you probably were not in, probably didn't yeah. see one. No. So take us through like that first call that you were on and like, you're like, you're riding up there, like what's going on, like yeah, emotions definitely. going through it and all that stuff. Yeah. So we, we did a training fire like we did a controlled burn and we practiced on that. And that was when I got my first taste of smoke and that one, like the adrenaline was kind of running, but it wasn't like, it was, it was under, it was a controlled circumstance. So it wasn't like we weren't worried about anything, but that experience, like getting the feel of not being able to breathe, feeling the heat, like uh, it felt like the best way I could describe my first experience. It felt like I was sitting in an oven and that I couldn't breathe. I was suffocating and it felt like I was going blind. Like my eyes, I was crying. My nose was just draining everything into my mustache. It was a gross scene. And it was just so hot and I couldn't breathe. Um, and you just, we call that just like eating smoke pretty much. So that was my first time. I got a good adrenaline rush, but man, when we got that first call, it was, uh, I was so nervous. I wouldn't say I was scared, but I was very nervous. Um, it's like, the best way I can describe it is like playing football in high school or like a big baseball game where you're playing the rival opponent and everyone's getting all amped up for it. And like that feeling of like running out of the tunnel, it was like that, but times a hundred. And I just remember I got in the engine, um, threw on my yellow shirt, um, texted my family, my mom and sister. And I was like, Hey, I had my first one. I always text them when I go to a fire and then let them know when I get back. But text Mm -hmm. them and we're going and I'm just hearing the radio chatter going and everyone's talking about this fire. And this was the thousand acre fire that blew up. So it was like a big one. So I'm I'm in the engine. Welcome to the game. (laughs) Yeah, I'm in the engine and I'm just like trying to write down notes and it's shaking. And my engine, the engine boss I was with was like, we're throwing you in the fire literally on this one. Like we're going crazy. And man, I, I don't even know like what my heartbeat was at. And, uh, yeah, the closer we got, the more like I just was getting amped up. You get just a huge adrenaline kick, and uh, it's kind of what we live for, though. Um, and then once we got up there, it was just the fire was so out of control, we literally couldn't even do anything. So we just kind of sat back and staged and made sure it wasn't going to hit town. But that like that rush that I got on the way, and I get that every single time still. Just mm-hmm. like you, you when you hear the page on your radio, and then some some switch in your head just flips and you kind of get locked in because you got to be ready to go but you don't know how long you're going to be out there you can be out there for multiple days you could be out there for an hour and be done with it so you have no idea what you're getting into but you got to be ready to go yeah for sure when you so i got two sort of thoughts that, that came into that the, the first one uh when you're out there for like more than a day or like a couple days do you like you do like in my head you wouldn't really want to be sleeping while the fire's there that and then food and or water and other stuff how does how does that sort of work how does the supply chain for that work so when we pack our gear um we have our we have a bunch of stuff in our packs that we we can't take off while we work so we have a bunch of water in there um we always pack a ton of water because we always get dehydrated on the fire line sure and then we we have mres that's what the military uses so it's just dehydrated food packages mm-hmm. 
And then we'll have like a jet boil fuel thing, which is just back country. You boil some water, you throw it in your MRE and you let it sit and then you get a meal. And those meals are like packed with calories. Like it's, it's crazy. It's like 2000 or something. I don't even remember. So we, we eat those when we're out there. Um, and it, at nighttime, like the humidity cranks up. So the fire activity kind of dies down a little bit. So if we're doing an overnighter, um, we usually have one to two people go on patrol and they'll walk around the fire line in shifts. And like we, ha we have headlamps and stuff. So we're able to like still work if we have to. But um, when we can get some sleep, we'll try to get like an hour or two of shut eye and then people patrolling will come and they'll try to sleep. And we usually just dig a little hole near the fire and that's where you're sleeping for the night. So. Gotcha. You mentioned the the humidity kind of at night is is that ever where you guys are like now this is when we can like kill this fire or is it mostly just containing until the next day or kind of how does that work how does the mindset work does it depend yeah. on the size and that sort of thing or yeah usually so if it's not contained by nighttime usually we're going to keep working through the night and try to get it like get a line dug fully around it get it contained and then the next day will typically be our mop up where we're crawling through the black area and feeling for hot spots because that that takes forever. That's that's the longest part of the job. So, mm -hmm. do you have? Um, I'm going to use this word because I can't think of a better one. But do you have a favorite sort of like method or one that you're more most comfortable with? I guess like call comes in you're like okay it's this one like we're good i know how to do this yeah so my favorite ones um are the grass fires out in the flat in the flats um because then we can drive our engine directly up to it we don't have to do any hiking and we have this technique called pump and roll and we can only do that when it's like in the flats or like not crazy steep terrain and like me and my other crew member will run to the back. My engine boss will be driving. Uh, me or the crew member will start the motor for the pump. We'll get water flown. And then we have this 100-foot line that comes out um, directly connected to the, to the tank. And we pull that out, throw it over the top of the engine, tuck it into the mirror, and then say, like, I'm doing it. I would hold the hose over my shoulder with my pack on and all my gear, and I will just run alongside the fire while my boss is driving next to it, and I'll spray it down. And that's that's probably the most fun one. You're just running with a fire next to you, just throwing water all over it. So, yeah, pump and rolls are, pump and rolls are pretty enjoyable, and those are usually the quickest ones to get a fire put out, too. So it's always nice when we get our engines right up next to it. Mm -hmm. Is that, I'm assuming, it's just because the, you have the amount of water that you do right there rather than having to dig and mm -hmm. whatever else. Yeah. I would think 500 gallons is, would go pretty quickly. Is that? Yeah, we, uh, and we try to preserve it as much as we can. So we won't crank the pump pressure up too high. Um, but like usually when it's like fire severity weather, when like July and August and September are rolling around, uh, we'll send two engines to each fire. So we'd have a thousand gallons. Mm -hmm. And then if we're running out of water there, we can order a tanker resource and have one of our truckers bring in a 2000 gallon uh, tanker. Maybe it might be more than 2000, but then we can refill um, on their tanker there. Gotcha. So, yeah, we have, we have means to keep refilling or we can go and if there's like a a river or a creek or a pond nearby we can do like drafting so we have these hoses in the back of our trucks that we can filter in and we can pump water into our tank from another water source mm. so that's cool yeah it's effective i hadn't really considered that because I, I in my head i just considered like like a stream or something would kind of be a natural barrier mm -hmm. um yeah, but we is, will, is that like, accurate we usually, also? Yeah, like if there's a there are natural barriers and we try to utilize those when we dig lines. So we'll always like anchor into one of those. Um but like a lot of times we'll have to like drive to get more water and then come back to the fire while someone else like we'll try to go in like rotations. Like my crew mm -hmm. will be the only one doing water and the other crew is just waiting for us to run out and then they'll start pumping water. So we try to like do it while we're refilling, they'll be 
putting the fire out. So try gotcha. to organize it like that. Gotcha. Um, are a lot of the fires or what, what portion of the fires would you say are human started accidents, that sort of thing versus like a lightning strike or something like that? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact numbers on it. I know a lot of, I've read a lot of data that man-made fires are the ones that end up being the big ones normally. Um, but I don't know the numbers on percentages. Um, a lot of abandoned campfires become fires from people out camping and having fires when they're not supposed to be. Um, people driving trucks with uh, tow, tow chains in the back that spark off and go into the side grass and start a fire that way. Um, people out, a lot of people out west, like they're shooting, so they'll go into the forest service land and shoot targets, and sometimes a bullet will hit a rock and spark a fire that way. Um, power lines are a big one. They'll start a lot of fires. But, I mean, I'd say the majority of mine last year were lightning strikes. Um, we get a lot of dry lightning. Like, we'll have storms come through, barely any precipitation, and a ton of lightning bolts. So... Most of the fires I'd say was lightning. Although we did we did have an arsonist last year who was a uh, kind of a pest. He started like five fires in one week, um, all in the same area. And we found him on our last one, like sitting up against a tree. And I was like, all right, we gotta get this guy out of here. <laughs> walk me walk me through that. Like when you did you figure out it was an arsonist on the first the first one? Or, yeah. Um, like walk me through sort of that whole process of like realizing that it's an arsonist and then figuring out because I, I would assume that the police at that point would kind of have to be involved a little bit and so how does that how did that relationship sort of work and yeah just kind of like walk me through that whole process yeah so um for most fires we have to determine the cause actually every fire we have to determine a cause um and if it involves something that's suspicious like that guy we knew was an arsonist because we found his like a pile of paper that was burned and he like burned his Subaru car manual or something. So we knew that was an arsonist causing fires. Um, and then they'll have a fire investigator come and do a full investigation of the scene and determine exactly what caused it, where it was it started. And then uh, from there, he, like it's, it's pretty tough to find the person unless the way we found him where he was like passed out next to the fire because he was having himself a week in the woods doing whatever he was doing just causing mayhem um but yeah it's just we'll have investigators come in we'll do our own kind of investigation like once we get it under control we go back to the origin and it's like okay this was this looks like a lightning strike or this looks like it was purposely caused there's fuel all over the place or something so mm. he was passed out next to the fire yeah, they uh he was on guy. Some, he was on some sort of drugs. So he uh his first thing was that he said was I'm really hungry. I haven't eaten in three days. Do you have any food? And we were like, man, this guy he's trying had to give him some of our snacks that we wanted and uh hike him out of there to the cops. Uh, I feel like just that I feel like for you finding him in that way is just like for real. I <laughs> know. Yeah, we were, it's kind of disbelief. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so when, when people are camping or going shooting or, or that sort of thing, what are some uh, safety precautions, I guess, that could be used to prevent some of the more like, like the abandoned campfire example or things like that, that seem very preventable, but still yeah. happen? Yeah. So like during, during fire season out West, um, because like here in Virginia, like everything's green. It's always humid, um, never short of yeah. rain. Um, not worried about wildfires here. Out there, we'll go a long time without rain. It gets pretty hot. It gets, we don't really have humidity. It gets real dry. So all the grass that's growing in the, the plains and the rural areas are just, they're getting knee waist high and they all dry out and they're all yellow. So it's really easy for fire to start out there. Like starting a campfire is so easy out there compared to here working with all that damp wood and stuff. So like abandoned campfires, 
typically during fire season, you're not supposed to be having campfires in the first place. Um, usually that's restricted, uh, depends, some places allow it. But then if you do have one, you're supposed to put it completely out. Um, I think Smokey the Bear says something about that, but uh, where you're supposed to like totally soak it and drown it in water, stir it all up, and then do kind of what we do with cold trailing is feel it and feel if there's any warmth in there. And if there is, you got to keep putting more water on there and you got to keep stirring it until it's totally dead now. And then uh, that'll, that'll take away any chance of a fire starting up because if you leave a hot spot in the bottom of it, those embers will just sit in there. And then all it takes is just a little breeze to blow it over into the grass. And then you got yourself a wildfire. Never realized how simple that would be. Yeah. I think most people out here with no sort of knowledge of that situation, if they have a campfire, they'll dump water on it and they'll be like, Oh, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And then out here, it's probably, that's probably the case that it's fine because mm -hmm. the ground is normally wet or at least damp and um, green. Yeah. yeah. And green as well. So it kind of helps. Whereas out there it's, you have to be extra, extra, extra thorough. Mm -hmm. um, that's crazy. It's just an extra level of detail. I feel like people mm -hmm. might not think to do, but yeah who knows do you guys kind of lost where i was going with that do you guys when you find fires like that are there sort of guidelines in like i know here in virginia like there's like there's like signs up for different things like hey when you do this thing make sure that you put the fire out or make sure that you don't do that and like do you guys have that sort of thing out there as well yeah, we have it everywhere. Just like no campfire signs or make sure it's dead and out. Like they're all over the parkland. Cause we have so many, we have so much land out there that people can just utilize everywhere. You can camp pretty much anywhere you want. And uh, so, yeah, they have to kind of scatter them out. Forest Service takes care of all that. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone's pretty knowledgeable, especially out there just cause they know they know more about wildfire and what it does to the community. Like if we get a big one, then the sky and the air is going to be smoky for weeks and we're not going to see, we're not going to see much sunlight. It's going to be gross. Like we had California drift smoke come into Montana last year. It was that bad. So we had like two weeks of just smoky skies and mm -hmm. uh, it's, yeah, it's just kind of miserable conditions when it gets like that. So everyone's usually pretty cautious and smart about it. Um, I think people have been getting more educated. So it's been That's good. good. Mm -hmm. That reminded me the other thing where I was going with that prevention from, from your perspective, what sort of things do you guys do to kind of um, keep the, the surrounding areas, I guess, um, uh, less flammable, I guess would be the word. Yeah. Um, so we, we can do there's like really two main methods. Um, one of them is going out and just doing thinning projects. So getting a crew, um, this is usually like a fuels team. They'll take their chainsaws and they'll go out and they'll grid out an area where they'll cut down a ton of trees and they'll spread them out. So spreading them out, then if a fire comes through um, and it, if they start crowning up in the top of the trees, it's not gonna just get extremely hot and take over the whole forest because it's not gonna be able to reach um the other trees as efficiently so kind of spacing out trees um saving those areas usually works pretty well um and then another way is um prescribed burns which the native americans actually even did their own prescribed burns way back um i think that's kind of where we got the idea from and that is pretty much purposely starting a fire and just burning part of the forest so then you like if there's a ridge line or something, you create a huge gap. And then so if a fire comes through, it hits that wall and then it's going to slow down. So um, prescribed burns are usually done in like the off seasons. So I think they're still going on now. I saw a couple out in uh, Missoula, Montana before I came back to Virginia for a week. Um, but yeah, they're probably going to stop doing that. They usually like to do that in the winter time when it's not like going to spread and there's snow all over the place. So yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll like dig line like in preparation for it. So they make sure that it's not going to start something that's out right. of their hands. Right, that makes sense. 
just out of my own curiosity, how did we figure out that the Native Americans were doing that and why they were doing it? Yeah, I think it had something to do with their crop rotations. Um, I can't remember exactly. And they also were, they, they had to deal with wildfires too. Um, so I think that was, I, I got to do my reading up on that again. I haven't read about that in a while, but um, I think they, that was their own way of just wildfire prevention to protect, uh, protect their own communities. So yeah, they knew about it. Yeah, smart people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, um, they knew they knew that land way better than we do. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Probably deserve some more credit than than we give them. But you mentioned California, the smoke drifting in from California. Why did those get as bad as they were? I think those were probably the ones that everybody heard of on the news. I know I had a couple friends out there that were like, "Yeah, we packed our bags just in case." Like. Mm -hmm fires a couple of miles away and then went the other like wind pushed it the other direction or something like that but yeah. then a couple other friends were like yeah we weren't really close but smoke was everywhere for like two weeks mm -hmm. so what about those in particular made it that bad yeah and california deals with they have a lot of unique fire weather things that happen to them i i believe it's called the santa Ana winds um mm -hmm. and they got like songs about them too and stuff but those winds come in and they can shift and change we deal with wind shifts and stuff and that makes dealing with fire very difficult usually firefighters have to get out of there and let it go so they can like get to safety themselves but they deal with those wind shifts a lot they deal with really hot weather um their terrain can get kind of rough and they, uh, and you hear more about them too, because they have way more people in California than Montana. So they got a lot more structures that can burn. So they have to do a lot of structure protection. Um, so I think a lot of the focus also gets deterred um, from the fire itself when you're thinking about all the people there that you got to save. Um, and then on top of that, I believe there's some sort of vegetation there that pretty much once it gets going, it burns up like gasoline. So I think it's some kind of bush or something. Um, can't remember the name of it, but yeah, that's, they got to deal with that stuff and that sounds miserable, but, and I'd have to, to dust up my knowledge on it. I'm pretty sure California like doesn't do much fire prevention work anymore. Um, I know, like, I think I read something in the eighties about how they stop their thinning projects. They don't do controlled burns. If, if they do, it's not, very much um so i'm sure that's not helping too much i don't know if they've updated that recently or what um but yeah like just letting the forest overgrow and all of the other contributing factors that they deal with is just it's really tough to kind of get a get a hold of those fires once they get going and with more people they get more man-made fires I, I know there was one fire last year where we lost a firefighter um in the gender reveal party someone had a gender reveal party and one of their things blew up a bunch of pink stuff and then a fire started at a park and then it ended up getting to like 300,000 acres or something and I think a firefighter went down in that one so that one was tough but yeah they just had a lot a lot more people to cause them and a lot more factors that make them a lot more difficult yeah I remember seeing the news about the gender reveal one and I face palmed extremely hard I was like yeah yeah, I feel so bad for that family too that started because it wasn't they didn't intentionally start it, but no, of course not. Yeah, yeah it was uh, that was tough because every every time we lose a firefighter, we hear about it in our morning briefing. Um, so yeah, that one was that one hurt a little bit. Um, yeah, it's like the really unfortunate thing about this job uh, when we lose firefighters is that's sadly the only way that we can learn how to advance our tactics by learning what not to do because we can't go out and like test new things on fires because it's too risky so mm -hmm. we pretty much learn from people that we lose which is really unfortunate but yeah and i um, obviously we don't have to go too deep into this but uh, i figured since i had you i would ask um when you guys get in like you get a briefing where the weather is optimal for a fire to, to spread quickly what sorts of tactics or uh, equipment do you guys have and or have you been in a situation where it's like, yep, here it comes, get the hell out of here. 
Yeah. Have um, you been in the spot like that? And like, what's yeah. it, what's it like when you guys are in that? Because I, I personally couldn't imagine being in, in that spot and then like functioning. Yeah. So yeah, the stress levels can get high when you're in situations like that. And um, that's where we're pretty good. A lot of our guys, like you kind of got to be like an adrenaline junkie and like live for that stuff. And when we get into situations before we even start working on a fire, we establish our safety zones, which are large areas where we can evacuate to. Um, we establish our anchor points. So like when we start digging line, we have to dig somewhere that is going to be a safe escape route if we have to get out of there. And then there's, uh, we establish trigger points. So like if trigger points are, if we see something, how the fire is behaving, if we see a fire whirl, which is pretty much a tornado of fire that shows that means severe fire activity, or if the trees are crowning fire, or if the fire spots over our line frequently or something, then that's like a sign that, okay, we're not going to be able to get a handle on this. We need to hit our escape route and get out of here. Um, and like I, we, we had some where we showed up to it and it was kind of like a, okay, we're going to have to sit and wait this one out until conditions kind of mellow out because there's nothing we can do anyways even if we tried it's just going to put us in danger and we're not going to be even be able to get the job done um yeah it's we're we're very on top of safety as best we can i mean a lot of things are out of our control um crews crews lose guys every year um pilots go down um something's just unavoidable. We had a, we had a crew, I won't dive too deep into it, but we had a crew out on, um, it was the Bridger Hill fire and outside of Bozeman, Montana, and they had a spot fire, uh, shoot way, embers can, embers can fly miles over your head and without you even noticing. So they had a spot fire shoot behind them. I uh, ended up creating like a four acre fire and started crawling up the hill and fire moves quicker when it goes up too. I don't know if I've mentioned that. So when you're on a is slope. That, is that cause heat rises? It's just, yeah, the flames are going up. So anytime that there's any vegetation at some sort of angle to that, it's gonna hit that quicker than going downhill. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, they had one coming up and they were kind of stuck in there, prepared a deployment site, which uh, when you do a deployment site, it's uh, kind of like your last stand. Um, you, you burn out the area around you. You try to get rid of anything that can burn near you uh, as best you can. And then they pull out, they pulled out their fire shelters, which are just these, I, don't, I can't, I don't know exactly what they're made of. It's pretty much just like an aluminum bag that you throw over your body. And it just, all it does is kind of protect you a little bit from the heat. Um, stories I've heard that we've learned about of what it's like to be in there is like literally just getting cooked. Um, but it protects you from the heat. It doesn't protect you from the flame or anything. And, uh, they went under and you kind of just like dig a hole and try to breathe for as long as you can. So those guys were under their shelter for a little bit, uh, the fire burned over them and they were lucky. Um, they, they just had, they just came out of there with a couple burns. I don't, I think one of the guys had, uh, some lung problems afterwards, but yeah, it's stuff like that's like the last resort. Um, when you get the fire shelter out, that's when things get pretty serious and you, uh, you don't really even know what your chances are. You kind of just go under that bag and you pray pretty much. So they ended up, they ended up being okay. And then luckily like they they came back they had a week off and then we had a big like safety briefing we they uh the wildfire community has like this set up for uh like mental health stuff so they brought in a team of like therapists and we had like a powwow and sat in a big circle and talked about it and how everyone felt about it and stuff because it, it it affects all of us like my crew knows like my, that could have been us you know you just mm -hmm. never know so yeah, we, we try to do as much as we can on safety precautions by staying up to date with the weather, trying to keep an eye on that fire, it's always checking behind you. So you got, you got to just kind of be, kind of got to be like a bird, like awareness, kind of looking at it from the top, seeing everything. So mm -hmm. it's tough. Are you, I feel like when you're on the job, you can't really be worried about not like obviously you're worried about what's around you, but you can't really be worried about that possibility. 
Yeah, I. Yeah. I don't know. What What are your What are your Obviously, I I'm not. I don't do that. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I the way I approach it, and I, I can't speak for everybody in fire, but like my my approach is I try not to think about like the worst possible outcome. Like I don't want to be like, all right, this could be the one. Um, you kind of got to like stay positive on it. But the thing with it though is you you do have to be you you can't just be like head down and dig for for the whole time. You got to always be looking up because another big killer is trees falling. Um, trees get burned up, they get weak mm -hmm. and they fall. So you got to always be aware of the trees around you. Got to be aware of the weather changes. A lot of times you can you can feel a wind shift direction. So you got to be aware of that. Always looking behind you, looking for spot fires. Um, so yeah, it's like, you do have to be like on top of your game doing everything. Um, and it's tough. It's tough to get the job done while also like thinking about your safety and the safety of your crew. So we do, uh, the good thing is like our crew, our bosses kind of like listen to us even like everybody in the crew has an equal say. Like if someone's uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a situation, they say, they say they're what they're thinking. They say like this, this doesn't seem good. Like, I don't, I don't think we should be up here. And then everyone just like, okay, let's get out of here. So everyone carries like the same weight of whatever mm -hmm. they say, which is good. So, but yeah, I, I try not to think about it, but I'm always, always aware of what possibilities could happen. So I don't end up getting stuck in a situation where yeah. I gotta throw the shelter on. Are, are most of you guys on the same page as far as yeah, we can deal with this or yeah, we should get out. Is it kind of like a, a similar sort of threshold for where the line is? For the most part, yeah. And like a lot of times when somebody will say something, it's because they they just happen to notice it. And like I, I could be like too locked into digging or something and I, I could just be zoned in and not focused on my surroundings and someone else is just that day more locked in on what's going on. So we're all, we all go through the same training and um, all have the same education on it. So when someone says something like, yeah, it's usually merits some, some weight to it. Yeah. If, if you're digging and you notice it's like an ember jump behind you and there's a spot fire, does, how do you deal with that? Does that take sort of priority or what yeah. is the procedure for that sort of thing? Yeah, if a, if a fire spots, we're taking care of the spot. So we'll, it depends where it's at, too. I mean, if it goes way down, um, and it just depends how many of them there are, too. So, but yeah, if there's a spot fire on the line, then we're going to take care of the spot fire first, just so it doesn't get to a point where it can trap us in, in between fires. And, and when you say take care of it, what sort of technique would that would that be? Yeah, so we'll uh, depend if it if it hits like a something that's thick, we'll get our chainsaw in there and we'll cut it up and we'll dig around it and then kind of just give make sure that the flames are gone and it'll stay hot, but we'll try to just contain that little spot so it's almost like we're treating it as a separate uh, fire from the main mm, fire. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. As far as the the mental health side of side of it. You you mentioned they brought in some therapists after that one uh, situation. How do you cope on a sort of day to day basis with with the job and with generally like the long work hours? And I'm sure you don't really have much free time to go kind of do what you want, especially like during fire season. Um, yeah. How how do you sort of cope with that and what's sort of a, a decompression day or session look like for you? Yeah. So during season, um, we, every morning we do PT workouts. Um, so we'll go for three plus mile runs every day and get our workouts in and do crew hike or something. And that, that stuff usually suffices enough during season because our minds are so occupied with work. Um, going like 12 days on two off and staying in that rhythm's nice. We're around each other. So we always are kind of just talking through everything with each other. Um, so yeah, during season's nice. Um, your mind's just so occupied and you're so physically exhausted at the time. You can't even think about it. Um, 
but yeah, in the off season, like it didn't really hit me that hard. And like thinking about the crew deploying until after the season, when I finally was just sitting on the couch doing nothing and I had nothing like no adrenaline cranking up or anything and things slowed down. And that's like, I'm, there's guys who deal with way more trauma where they see one of their fellow crew members go down or have a tree fall on them and they got to cope with that. And, um, everyone kind of has their own thing. A lot of guys are like big time marathon runners. They'll focus on that. Um, there's, uh, in the community, I know it's, it's growing. They're getting a lot more like therapists and stuff, um, that are freely given to us to talk to the community takes care of us really well. Um, and like myself, I, I play a lot of guitar and I do a lot of writing. So I've, I've spent this off season, um, did my EMT course, uh, got that certification and spent a lot of time uh, finishing up writing some poetry, trying to get a poetry collection together and publish. So I've kind of found my balance with in the summer, I'm all engaged on fire. And then in the off season, I'm just, I'm writing. So it's pretty much, that's how I'm balancing. I'm writing everything out. So trying, to get, some, trying to get better sleep schedule though. <laughs> yeah, of, of course, I'm sure. I'm sure a full night's rest, like the first <laughs> couple of days that you were it's, off season, you're tough. like, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> was writing something that you were always into growing up, or is that sort of a is that a new hobby that, yeah. kind of that came out of this? Yeah, I've always been into writing. Um, I've probably been writing since high school. I actually like probably maybe middle school. Um, a lot of times I just, I, I sleep terribly. I wake up like four to five times every night, but a lot of times when I wake up, I'll just have like words, just vomit out. So I, uh, that was when I first kind of dabbled with like writing poetry and stuff. Um, I just wake up and write a whole thing down. Sometimes I'd wake up in the morning and look at my phone and saw that I like slept wrote. I don't even, I don't know if that's a thing, but I, I like <laughs> slept wrote a poem. And, uh, that was when I was like, okay, I kind of like this stuff. Um, got into college, uh, tried to start writing a novel, got to like 60,000 words and then was so caught up with other stuff in school that I just let it go. And poetry kind of a little easier because just short writings that I, I can do mm. in 10 to 15 minutes. So yeah, I've just been kind of just building up on that. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's kind of a good release for me. Um, step away from everything and kind of just let my mind do what it wants to do. And put some words down and started like posting them on this social I hate social media I got I, I got nothing against it for people that have it I love like I get like connecting people's awesome I used to be big into it um but I got into the grasps of social media again I started posting poetry and it's it's cool to see like some people like that can relate and connect to certain emotions and how like I like to think like it makes some people feel like they're not alone in whatever struggles they're going through and that whatever struggles they're going through is unique and as individualistic as it is to them and nobody else understands that exact feeling but they're they're not completely alone there's people who can kind of relate you know mm -hmm. so it's, yeah. it's nice to see like that people like messaging me and stuff people I don't even know and they're like saying they connect you with some of the words so I get a good kick out of that so yeah that's good no, I'm with you on social media. Generally, I deleted Twitter off my phone a couple of years ago and yeah. Facebook the same. Like I still have the accounts, but I don't hardly ever go on other than to Twitter for like scores and stuff mm -hmm. occasionally or sometimes I like I follow a couple of like meme accounts and like those are always fun <laughs> once in a while. But like generally speaking, like I don't spend nearly the same amount of time that I used to and I've been definitely happier Mm -hmm. for it obviously i spent some time on for the podcast like sharing the podcast and trying yeah. to promote and, and different things but generally speaking it's, it's not there's so many other things to do with your time mm -hmm. that I, I found personally anyways yeah. i know some people use some people have enough of a sort of know-how that they've turned it into like a semi-career they make money off it and like props to them but I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, and I get it. Like it's, it's nice, like being able to stay in touch with people and everything, I guess. I, I just had a desire to kind of go off the grid when I made the decision to live out of my truck in Montana. So that mm -hmm. was, 
I just had a different drive. Um, I guess maybe not even like desiring to stay as intact with the world, but I, I see like the positives of it and there are good things and there are bad things that come with it. But mm-hmm. yeah, I was definitely spending too much time on it. I had to get out. <laughs> I noticed you went off the grid because when I heard that you were doing the firefighting thing and I was like, Oh, let me see if I can like message him and see if he wants to come on the podcast. And I was like, I can't find him anywhere. He doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I found, I found the writing page and that's how it kind of, yeah. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's him. I'm going to message the page. And if it's not him, and if it's not him, this is going to be really weird, but, but it was, so it worked itself out in the end. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the fitness uh, test or not test, but like the workouts that you guys do, do you guys have a standard of like, you guys have to pass this and this test before you guys are allowed to mm-hmm. go out in the field? Yeah. So to get, we, it's, uh, our certification to fight fire is called a red card. So to get your red card and these, these standards are pretty, pretty uh, reachable by uh, a lot of people. It's a two mile run under 18 minutes or 20 minutes, and then doing a certain amount of push ups, certain amount of sit-ups. And then we do a thing called a pack test um, where we put on 45 pounds and we do a three mile hike under a certain amount of time, I believe it's 40 minutes or something. Um, and once you get on the hot shots, their pack test is harder. Their standards are higher. Um, my crew kind of does their own thing. We, we do our certification testing, but then every week we do a physical fitness test of a three mile run, pull-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, and we kind of compete with each other in that way. So everyone, I mean, like staying in shape is really, you want everyone on your crew to be in good hike and shape and work in shape. Cause if you can't hike up to the fire, you're not going to be able to fight the fire. So yeah, hundred percent. I think that's one of the, probably the underrated things or the, one of the things that goes kind of unnoticed is the, the actual, like the physical fitness that you guys put in. Yeah. Um, so that sort of thing. The hot shots, I know you mentioned them earlier, but just out of my own curiosity, are they like how, how do you become one? Because a firefighter, like is is not it's not like the, the US military where it's like, for example, the army, the army and then the army rangers or navy and then navy seals. It's like by you said I think you worked for the state of Montana, and then there's obviously local and regional fire departments. Mm-hmm. And, that sort of thing. So how does, how does that work? Yeah. So it's, um, it's through the federal, uh, government, the forest service, and you apply, um, just like any other job, um, give me resume qualifications, all that, um, getting on the shots though, is they usually look for guys with some experience, um, like usually a couple years. So after this year, I'll be applying to the hot shots and, um, just pretty much anywhere in the country um so yeah it's just you usually got to start somewhere like the initial attack crews or volunteer or some something of that sort or if you're in the military they like previous military experience so get some sort of fire experience and then hot shots are a little more welcoming to you and then that's that's also why i got my emt this year so every crew kind of wants some sort of medic on their on their team yeah you stole my next question I was gonna ask if that was a dream of yours, but not only is it a dream, you're already you're already doing it. You're already yeah, trying I'm, to do it. I'm pursuing it. Yeah, I gotta I gotta get my mile time down a little bit, but we're getting there. Yeah. So when when did you decide that that was something that you wanted to do? Because you've only been doing it for for a year or so. Yeah. Um. Pretty much my first day on the job last year was when I was like, yeah, this is the kind of lifestyle I'm looking for, and then. Once I got on my first real fire where I was eating smoke, I, uh, it definitely got into my blood and I was like, yep, this is, this is what I want to do until they kick me out. So that was when I fell in love with it and decided I wanted to kind of take it to, I want to just take this thing to its extreme. So I want to get on the bigger ones. I want to travel a little bit, get on those crazy fires. And then, I mean, ultimately the dream would be to be a smoke jumper and jump out of planes, but that's, uh, that's pretty tough, tough goal. There's only 400 of them in the whole country. So you got to be one of the top dogs in the, 
in the community for that. So just got to keep working my way up. Yeah. Does that come from the athletic background? Do you think the just desire to be the best at what you're doing or is that a, or is this something different inside you? Um, I'd say a little bit of the athletic background. I've definitely, I'd probably attribute it more to this kind of like getting addicted to an adrenaline rush and kind of wanting more. And uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of like a, a drug, I guess. Um, I, I'm addicted to fighting fire and I want to just kind of keep pushing its limits and see crazier things and get some, some more experiences that, um, that I can like go back on to relive, you know? Yeah. Does that worry you at all? <laughs> just like, <laughs> just, just the feeling of like, cause you said that fairly freely. I know most people when, when they say they're not that this is a bad addiction or anything, but does, does that worry you ever that like, this is sort of the, the path you've chosen, like you've chosen per se, like, like, yes, I really want to be in danger all the time. <laughs> I, uh, see, I, I love it because I'm able to like give back to the community. And if I can save some people's homes in the process as well, like that makes me feel really good and makes me kind of, gives me kind of a purpose, um, so I, I, I don't have any kind of worry about it, but I know my mom and sister definitely are a little more concerned about these feelings. <laughs> they get, they get pretty nervous. So. Yeah, that's fair. Not that that answer was like the gatekeeping for you being the right person for that job, but it's pretty, it's a pretty good answer. Um. If you look down the road, we'll say like, three, five years from now, what is, what is, if you had to say everything has gone my way, like how I want it to go, where are you three to five years from now? Three to five years from now, I'm on a hotshot crew or a smoke jumping crew. And I have one to two books published. And in the off seasons, I am going to some Island in South America to just live on a beach. That's the, uh, that'd be the ideal situation for me. (laughs) This that's not a bad <laughs> it's not a bad gig, man. Not a bad yeah. gig. Yeah. Well, it's been a little more like uh this, damn, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half now. I don't want to take up <laughs> take up too much of your time, but I really appreciate having you on. It's definitely been super educational for me and hopefully all you guys listening as well. Oh, man, um, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Next uh next off season for you we'll have to get you back see if you're a hot shot or not by then <laughs> yeah. yeah hopefully i'll bring some good news yeah and, and then more, we can more cool uh, stories <laughs> of course and then we can clickbait the title hot shot <laughs> you know yeah. that's how it is it's been a pleasure nolan yeah man thanks yep bye everybody <laughs>